Yeah. All right. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to another CU Prime talk. Could you go to the next slide? Yes. So uh, for everyone in the room, if you haven't already, go and sign into the laptops uh, so we know how many of you are uh, in case. So we know how much pizza to order for next time. That's the main reason. So if you don't know what CU Prime is, uh, we are a student organization that's led by students and designed for students. And so we have a few different things that we do. One of them is uh, this bi-weekly talk series uh, where we have grad students talk about their research and help to personalize what it means to do science. We also have a course that's offered each fall and we run a mentorship program as well. Um, so if you are wanting to be a part of any of those things, that's awesome. We're always looking for new people uh, to help out and uh, yeah, help us to foster a good um, community within the physics department. So this, uh, today we have a talk from Charles Stahl, who is going to tell us about quantum and classical hard drives. So I will let you take it away. Thank you. I'm excited to um, give this talk today. I hope that it's um, informative, but not confusing. Um, I'll start by telling you a little bit about myself as a person. I um, grew up in Wisconsin, right outside of Milwaukee in a town called Shorewood. Um, and then I went to undergrad in New Jersey at Princeton. Um, I, I think I knew going in that I wanted to study physics, um, but I was a little intimidated um, by some of the uh, just the math requirements for theoretical physics. So I didn't know what sort of physics I would want to do. Um, but throughout my time there, I was able to take some great physics classes and um, decided that I wanted to stick with it. Um, my senior year, I didn't get into any of the PhD programs I applied to, but I did get into a master's degree uh, in England. So that's what I did for the year um, after my senior year. Um, so that was a fun time. It was a, it was a one year program and it focused, focused um, mostly on just taking classes instead of doing any sort of um, research projects. Uh, so that was a time where I was able to learn a lot more physics than I had just in undergrad. Um, and in doing that, I decided that the type of physics that I wanted to do is what's called condensed matter physics. So um, it's really the study of the physics of materials. So um, it's not, it's, it's sort of as opposed to high energy physics, which is the study of individual particles or um, something spacey. It's all, it's all like materials that can exist on the earth in sort of maybe extreme conditions, but not as extreme as you might find in a collider. Um, so these are all pictures taken from the website of the condensed matter theory department at Boulder or the condensed matter theory group at Boulder. Um, the types of things that physics or that condensed matter physicists study are uh, phases of matter. So these are things like liquid crystals, which are sort of exotic phases of matter. Um, if you've used a screen recently, uh, you've used a liquid crystal. I think most most uh, computer screens and other uh, screens that we have are have liquid crystal displays. So it's the the properties of the liquid crystal phase that um, make them useful for screens. Um, Condensed matter physicists also study uh, what are called phase transitions. So when you have a material that's in one phase and then it transitions into another phase, um, there are lots of interesting properties of that uh, transition that, that, that condensed matter physicists like to study. Um, recently, a part of condensed matter physics that has blossomed into a major part of the field is uh, information dynamics. So that's sort of how information exists within a material and how information travels around a material. So sort of basic examples of that are like, I have a piece of wood here. I can, I can knock on the piece of wood and the wood vibrates. Those sound waves travel throughout the wood. Um, and that's a, a basic way that information can travel throughout a material. Um, but there are lots of more interesting ways um, that different kinds of information can travel throughout materials. Um, so that's been a, a big area of research for condensed matter theory over the past couple decades. Um, and today, the talk that I'm going to give you will focus on different kinds of uh, information and not necessarily information dynamics, but information storage. So um, we have some information, we want to write it down, 
and then come back to it later and make sure that it hasn't changed at all. Because um, if it changes, it's not very good storage. So one place that we do that a lot is with computers. You have something that you want to keep in the computer, some sort of file or some sort of messages or whatever it is that you keep in your computer. Um, you want to make sure that when you come back, it has changed. And um, that's, I think we, I at least usually take that for granted. Um, but there's this really great video um, from the Veritasium YouTube channel. Uh, I think the title of the video is The Universe is Hostile to Computers. But the point of the video is that, is that um, it's not trivial for computers to be able to store this information. Um, and and the, the people who design computers put tons of work and, and thought into making sure that computers can store information as reliably as possible. Um, but sometimes there can be just uh, freak events that can, can uh, change that information. So the example that they focus on in this video is um, what's called cosmic rays. And the idea is that in some distant galaxy, um, some star goes supernova and explodes and emits a, a ton of these really high energy particles. And then they are uh, just stream through space. And every once in a while, one of them hits Earth. And if it happens to hit the individual location in your computer that is storing a certain bit of information, it can flip that bit. So they go through a couple of really great examples, really fun examples. Um, one time when somewhat there was some local election and the vote count didn't add up and no one could figure out how. And all I can think is that it must have been some sort of cosmic ray incident. Um, another one with some speed runner who was trying to go through some level in some video game and did it way faster than anyone ever had before. Um, uh, essentially by glitching into the place, like the winning condition, whatever it was. Um, so if that sounds cool to you, you should definitely watch this video. Um, but so given that, given that the universe is hostile to computers and wants to, wants to change whatever information is present, why can we rely on them at all? So to, to partially answer that question, we're going to talk about magnets. So hopefully you've all had the chance to play with a magnet before. Magnets, uh, bar magnets at least have a North Pole and a South Pole. And um, you can look at these magnetic field lines that come out of and into the magnet. You can actually see the magnetic field lines um, with um, iron filings. Uh, if you haven't done that recently, it's fun. Um, it's, it's fun to see that the fields actually exist. Um, but for our purposes, we can just think of them as these lines that leave the North Pole of the magnet and enter the South Pole of the magnet, and they have these little arrows on them, so they're directed. Um, if you bring two magnets together, the, the second magnet will want to align itself with the field lines of the first magnet. So when I say align, I mean, you can imagine that the, this, this new magnet has an arrow pointing at it from the South Pole towards the North Pole, and that arrow wants to point in the same direction as the field lines. Um, so that's what makes, when you have two magnets, that's what makes the North Pole and the South Pole want to line up. Uh, but things work a little bit differently if instead of just having two magnets, you have a whole bunch of them. So let's say that we have this row of magnets. We have six magnets here. We're going to hold them all in place, but then put a seventh magnet in the middle. And I want you to um, turn around and meet your neighbors and uh, introduce yourselves and discuss whether you think that a seventh magnet put in the middle would want to align itself with the North Pole up or with the North Pole pointing down. So discuss amongst yourselves. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring everyone back in. I, I heard um, a lot of different arguments, um, but one argument that I heard and is actually the argument that I uh, think is the most compelling, even if it doesn't end up being correct, is that from the previous example, it seems like the North Poles are attracted to the South Poles and the South Poles are attracted to the North Poles. So you would think that maybe you might think that the seventh magnet that we're adding into the middle would want to point down. Um, it's a little bit of a trick. Uh, it ends up being that the magnet points up. And before showing that slide, I'll just explain that the idea is that the magnets want to align with the local magnetic field. So here, all of these arrows are uh, pointed up here. So as opposed to the previous example, where the local magnetic field here points down, so the new magnet wanted to align down, 
Now the local magnetic field here is pointed up. So the result is that the new magnet uh, ends up pointing up. So um, uh, moving forward, uh, the only uh, conclusion that we'll want to draw from this is that when you, even though for a single magnet, they want to anti-align, or for a single pair of magnets, they want to anti-align, once you have a whole bunch of them, they want to all be pointing in the same direction. Um, and the, the uh, uh, simplification that will be useful for the rest of the talk is to just think that each, each magnet just looks at its nearest neighbor, two nearest neighbors, and wants to align with both of them. Um, so so uh, throughout this talk, um, I'm going to be drawing more pictures of magnets. And I, I got sick of drawing all the Ns and Ss and all the field lines and everything. So I'm going to uh, sort of at a first approximation, we could draw them all as arrows with the arrow pointing towards the north, north pole um, from the south pole towards the north pole. Uh, but the even simpler picture that I'll end up using is just colored boxes. So like, this colored box here, the blue box, means that the arrow is pointing, or that the magnet is pointing up. And then I'll use red boxes to say that magnets are pointing down. And the rules will just be that boxes that are next to each other want to have the same color. So now that we've uh, explained all that, what does this have to do with errors? We have these computers that have information in them, but, but we know that errors happen. It could be something fanciful like cosmic rays, or it could be something a little bit more mundane, like just interactions from the environment. And we want to say, how can we protect ourselves against these errors? So the simplest way to ensure that you remember a message is to repeat it. Um, the simplest way to ensure that you remember a message is to repeat it. The simplest way to make sure that you remember a message is to repeat it. Uh, that's a little bit that I got from um, Ariel, uh, a different grad student, Ariel Schlossberg's uh, C prime talk in 2019. He had, a, he had a, he did a talk about error correction, and I thought that was a, a good um, way to, to introduce this simplest form of error correction, which is just called the repetition code. So the idea is that we want to encode the zeros and ones, the, the binary objects that live in the computer, as um, sort of series, ser series of um, magnets. And we'll say that anytime we want to write down a zero, we just put a whole row of ups, which I'm writing as blues. And anytime we want to put a one, we put a whole series of downs, which I'm drawing as reds. Um, so that means that we'll come back later and look at them all and see, are they all blue or all red? And that's how we'll sort of read back our information that we stored originally. So that's, that's what's called the encoding. That's how we encode our information, and then we'll decode it later. So what, what's, what's the point, sort of? Uh, what, why is this useful? So the idea is that we're going to start with this row of blues and then assume that the environment interacts with our system somehow. Um, and it's going to interact by introducing some errors. This is a, a, a decent sort of first order approximation for how uh, the, the, the storage device um, behaves at uh, non-zero temperature. So the environment is interacting with it. It, it causes some errors. And then um, you can now turn to your neighbors again, who you have now introduced yourselves to, and um, ask what happens next. So the, the environment flipped this one magnet. What next? Discuss amongst yourselves. So to, to start, talking about what happens next. Maybe we can talk just about this, this blue magnet here. Um, the one that flipped to red now is, is trying. I'm going I'm to keep on using words like try and want, even though these magnets don't have wishes or desires. Um, this, this red magnet is still trying to make this blue one turn red. But at the same time, its other neighbor over here is trying to make sure it stays blue. So, so it's sort of caught in between these two. But this red one here. Um, is caught between two blue neighbors, and both of those blue neighbors want it to switch over to blue. Um, so in, in our first order approximation, uh, the red one will flip immediately back to blue. So the environment flips it to red, but then its neighbors force it to turn back to blue. Um, the, the next uh, condition that we're going to um, 
analyzed is one where the environment is sort of extra obnoxious and flips two of them at the same time. So um, now I think I have a slide to say what happens next, which magnets flip over. But I think that we've, um, I think that I heard most people talking about the idea that in this sort of configuration, each of these magnets, each of this one, two, three, four magnets, they all have one blue neighbor and one red neighbor. So it's not necessarily clear what's going to happen. Obviously, if we could flip both of the red ones back, then we would sort of everyone would be happy again. But there's no one single flip that can make everyone happy. So in a, in a situation like this, it's, it's sort of um, equally likely for different blue ones to flip to red or for different red ones to flip to blue. Um, so uh, uh, a way to analyze that type of system is say that a whole bunch of the ones over here have flipped to red. So now we just have some that are red and some that are blue. And essentially there's this one place right here where the, uh, the system is unhappy because it has two neighbors that are uh, one's, one's red and one's blue. But, but we could have more flipped red or we could have more flipped blue. There's no preference for one or the other. So um, in this type of situation, we're gonna say that there's what's called an excitation at the boundary between the red domain and the blue domain. And furthermore, this, ex this excitation is deconfined in the sense that it can move to the left, which would be good for our um, storage device, but it could also move to the right, which would be bad for our storage device. So either one is just as likely. There's no preference for one or the other. But we can do better. And we can do better by, instead of analyzing a one-dimensional chain of magnets, by analyzing a two-dimensional uh, surface of magnets. So now we have all these magnets here, and they can all be blue or red. And again, if we want to store a zero in our computer, we do it by making all of the magnets blue. And if we had wanted instead to store a one, we would have made them all red. But I didn't draw that just because it would have taken an extra slide. Um, well, uh, we still have the rule where each magnet wants to match its neighbors, but now each magnet has four neighbors. So you can, you can look at a magnet, look at what its four neighbors are doing, and then figure out what that magnet will want to do. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to give you another situation where the environment has now flipped these 11 magnets. Um, so first of all, discuss with your neighbors, um, does that top red magnet want to flip? Sounds like I heard a lot of yeses, um, which is good. So, so that, that top red magnet has three blue neighbors and one red neighbor. So the majority wins, it will want to flip back to blue. So we get to this situation where now we have this sort of block of 10 red magnets in the middle. Um, so now, do any of the magnets want to flip? Again, discuss with your neighbors. So I heard, I heard a lot of people talking about the corners. So we can look at one of the corners and so let's, let's talk about this corner here. And as I, as, as I heard people say, this, this red magnet here has two red neighbors and two blue neighbors. So it, it doesn't want to flip. Um, it has sort of equal probability of flipping or not flipping, but there's nothing that immediately tells it that it should flip. Um, but at the same time, it, it's, there's, it seems like there's something special about these corners. There's a reason that I think people were drawn to the corners right away. Um, and and uh, that intuition is correct. The argument is that if this has an equal probability of flipping or not flipping, it can just wait for a while until it does flip because eventually it will flip. Uh, just again, because it has an equal probability of flipping or not flipping. So if you wait long enough, it will flip. Once it has flipped, now, this one has three blue neighbors and one red neighbor. So as soon as this one flips, this one will flip also. So the idea is that, again, we can, we can draw this, uh, this uh, boundary between the red domain and the blue domain. And with the rules that we've said, where magnets want to match their neighbors, this domain is, um, or this excitation, this, this uh, gold line is confined. It can shrink but it can't grow. Um, so this is great for our memory. If we um, store it as a bunch of blue magnets and then the environment flips some to red, if we wait long enough, 
the system itself will make the magnets flip back to blue. So, uh, oh yeah, so, so that's, that's what we call confined because the, the, um, the, the yellow excitation can't grow um, without continually putting more energy in from the environment. This distinction that we've drawn between the system that has the deconfined excitations and the system that has the confined excitations is a distinction between volatile and non-volatile memory. So the, the volatile systems, uh, you have to watch them or regularly correct whatever errors might appear. Because if you let the errors happen and then don't fix them right away, they can grow um, to be very large. And then you might flip all of your blues to red, which is bad. Um, whereas the non-volatile memory is self-correcting in the sense that the, 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 the dynamics of the system will correct any errors introduced by the environment. So volatile memory is something like uh, your computer memory, so the, the, the RAM, where your computer only uses RAM when it's on and uh, when it's being supplied power, either from a cord or from your battery. Um, Whenever you turn your computer off, all of the information gets put into your storage. So that could be something like a hard drive or um, on more modern computers um, have solid state drives, which are made of flash memory. So hard drives actually use magnets. Um, a hard drive, uh, a hard disk is a, is a ring of metal and it has these small magnetic domains and they, they really have all the magnets pointing up for zero and all the magnets pointing down for one. Um, flash storage is a little bit different, so I'm not gonna, I don't even know how it works, but, but um, magnetic storage is, is a real thing, um, but it has to be two-dimensional magnets for the reasons that I've just gone through. Um, and then for, for condensed matter physicists like myself, the distinction between volatile and non-volatile memory is that, uh, Volatile systems are stable at zero temperature. So that's essentially when the environment is not uh, introducing errors to the system. Whereas non-volatile memory is stable even when the temperature is non-zero, but only up to some critical temperature. So like for a magnet, that critical temperature would be the temperature at which the magnetization disappears. It's called the Curie temperature, but that's not important. Um, so again, the volatile memory is like, the 1D magnets in, in the real world, they're systems that have to constantly be supplied with power. Whereas the um, non-volatile memory is the 2D magnets. Um, this, is a, this is what a hard drive, hard disk looks like inside. This is the metal disk that actually has magnets in it. Um, and then a cassette tape, again, sorry, it's a little blurry, but the cassette tape um, is also magnetic storage. It's analog instead of digital, so it's a little bit different, but it still has um, uh, little magnets all along the plaque. So this is sort of a halfway point in my talk and the next half is gonna be a little different. So if anyone has any questions about what we've talked about so far, this would be a great time for them. Yeah. I at least can think of like a cassette tape I would think more the linear picture, basically. Yeah. The tape down the line and read it from there. But is on that tape, is it really more of this area picture? Is this two grid? Yeah. So you could, the, the way to think about it is that is that on the magnetic tape, each of these little boxes is much smaller than the width of the tape. So you have a whole bunch of them um, for each like for each linear section of the tape. You have a whole bunch of these domains. So it's a it's an effect of the two dimensional material. Yeah. So for this volatile memory, how how does the, the computer watch the state to make sure it doesn't switch when it's connected to power? Ah, uh, right. So so um, like the the RAM in your computer is not magnetic storage. So um, it it watches it uh, some other way. I think that usually you can. You can actually, it, it's a pretty simple circuit of AND gates and OR gates that you can 
draw to, to make sure that it stays at high voltage, but I can't remember what it's called. It has a name. I don't know if anyone, uh, but yeah, this it's, it's some electrical circuit rather than a magnetic storage. Um, but if, if, if we were going to uh, continue using the, um, uh, continue using the um, analogy of magnets, essentially what you could do is you wouldn't look directly at a magnet to see whether it was blue or red, because sometimes you would want it to be blue and sometimes you would want it to be red. You would just look and make sure that always the two neighbors match. And if you catch it early enough, you'd be able to make sure that you flip the red back to blue rather than flipping a bunch of blues over to red. I've been talking a little faster than I practice, so I'll have plenty of time if people do have any more questions. Cool. So I advertised this talk as um, classical and quantum hard drives. Um, so the idea there is that quantum information is fundamentally different than classical information. The classical information, uh, or at least classical digital information, you can all store using zeros and ones. Um, quantum information needs more in some sense. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of how that works. Um, Jacob Becky gave a CU Prime talk in the fall about it. I'm sure you can find plenty of YouTube videos if you're interested in that, um, or take a quantum mechanics class uh, here sometime. Um, but instead, I'm just going to, to present the idea that you need this concept, which is superposition. Instead of just having zeros and ones, you can have these quantum, stage, quantum states, which are uh, uh, linear combinations of zeros and ones. Um, I'm not going to go into any more detail about what that really means, but instead I'm just going to present to you a, a model of a system that is able to store this type of information and um, uh, go from there a little bit. Uh, so this, this, this system that I'm gonna describe, part of, I'm gonna describe part of the system to you. The system is called the Toric code. Um, it's a really cool piece of physics and um, I'll just give you a little flavor of how it works. So again, we're gonna work with magnets. Um, it turns out that they have to be quantum magnets, but but again, we can, we can work in a simplified picture where they're just gonna be like the magnets that we had before. Um, the way that we're gonna arrange them is that we're gonna have this lattice. So that's these, these um, straight lines are sort of just a, a background. And then we put one magnet on each edge of the lattice. So this is how essentially the, just the organization of these magnets. Now, the, the new ingredient is that instead of saying that each magnet wants to match its nearest neighbors, we're gonna say that at each vertex of the um, lattice, there, can be, there must be an even number of blue magnets and an even number of red magnets. So that means that these eight vertices are the only vertices that are allowed. Um, so what we'll do is we'll start with a reference state and then allow our environment to introduce some errors and then talk about what happens. So that reference state that we'll start with um, is the state where all of the magnets are blue. So if we look at say this vertex here, there's four blue magnets and four is an even number and there's four, or excuse me, there's zero red magnets and zero is also an even number. So since that's the case at all of the vertices, um, that means that all of the vertex rules are satisfied. Um, so now again, let's say that we have some environment and the environment uh, introduces an error to this particular magnet. Um, I'm gonna again have you go discuss with your neighbors. Um, and the, the goal is to just think about which rules are not satisfied and therefore where uh, the possible excitations might be. So I heard a lot of good discussion about um, where the excitations might be, and then also people sort of moving on to what's next, which is good. People are anticipating what I'm going to talk about. Um, but I think that what everyone agreed was that the two vertices that are unhappy 
are this one and this one, because on both vertices there's a single red edge and three blue edges. And um, yes, of course that's correct. So we say that, that that single error creates two excitations, one on each side of the error. Um, and then I heard people talking, so sort of starting to think about what's gonna happen when there are more errors. So I'll give you this slide and um, again, go off and, and, and talk about where the errors are gonna be. So I think that everyone I heard agreed that the vertices that are unhappy are these two vertices. Um, and then what I really liked hearing is that a lot of people were, again, trying to figure out what would happen next. Um, so of course we could satisfy all the vertex rules by turning all of them blue again. That would just be going back to the original state. Um, but then also if you imagine sort of flipping this one, and this one, and this one, okay. this one, and this one, and this one, so that we have a closed loop of reds, then there also wouldn't be any excitations. Um, so that's a, that's, that's, that is a statement that's of fundamental importance to the way that this works as a quantum mechanical model. Um, again, I'm not going to go into details about that, but if you want to ask me some things about it afterwards, I would be beyond happy to talk about it. It's probably my favorite physics thing to talk about. Um, but for now, all we need to say is that there are these two excitations at the ends of the strings. And just like in the one dimensional magnet, these excitations are, are deconfined. So um, you'll have to take my word for it that this, this toric code can act as a quantum memory, but then you should be able to tell me that it cannot be a quantum hard drive because it's, it's volatile. These excitations are mobile, they can move around, there's nothing that confines them. So if this system goes and lives at finite at non-zero temperature somewhere, it, it will at some time have um, errors in it, like logical bad, really bad errors, not just local errors. So, so this, this, this um, model is I think about 25 years old now. Um, when it was introduced, it was the first um, example of a model of a material that could be a quantum memory. Um, I think that there are proposals for materials, like physical materials, real world materials that might behave this way, but none have been proven to do so yet. But there's sort of two parallel searches. There's one for a, a physical material that will behave this way, but there's a second search, which is for something that can act as a quantum hard drive in the same sense that the two-dimensional magnet was a classical hard drive. So, um, oh, uh, let's see, what was I gonna say here? I think this, I already said this, and then I just have a slide here to say that the, the actual model is a little bit more complicated. There's two different kinds of excitations, but um, both, both types of excitations are deconfined. So it really is just a memory, not a hard drive. Um, but in the, in the magnets case, we went from one dimension to two dimension and, and had a, a better memory because of it. So for this toric code, we can, we can start to do something similar. There's a, there's a three-dimensional analog of the toric code and I won't go into too many of the details, but just like we had the two kinds of um, string-like operators in the two-dimensional toric code, in the three-dimensional code, there's this sort of membrane-like operator and a string-like operator. So for the membrane, the excitations are on its boundary, like we had in the 2D magnet. So that means that these membrane operators are confined, and that's good for memory purposes. But the problem is that we still have these string-like operators, which have uh, excitations on their endpoints. These excitations, once they're created, they can move around freely. So they are, again, deconfined, which is bad for memory purposes. So essentially, no, not a, not a quantum hard drive. Although it's hard to draw pictures of it, there's, there is what's called a, a model of a four-dimensional toric code. Um, and in this code, it, uh, both types of operators are membrane operators. So both types of operators are defined. That means that the four-dimensional toric code could serve as a quantum hard drive. Uh, the only problem is that it's four-dimensional. So our, our, our world is three-dimensional. So it, it, 
it can't be a useful model in our world. But the, the conclusion to draw from the 4D Torque code is that at least in principle, it's possible to have a quantum hard drive. Uh, but it's still an open question as to whether it's possible in three space dimensions. Um, so people have spent a lot of time and effort over the past 20 years trying to find some sort of quantum hard drive. And as I said, they haven't yet, but they've found other fun things along the way. Um, and the, the, the big thing has been fractons. So um, there's this professor at Caltech named Chia Chen, who um, uh, I think she has some talk, I think it's on YouTube, um, uh, that where she talks about quantum hard drives and fractons in more technical detail. And that's, that's where I got the idea of talking about this type of research as um, hard drives. Um, and and this search has led to this new type of behavior called fractons. Um, it's, fractons are fun because Boulder has been a, a, a center of the research in, into fractons. So um, if you start to read fracton papers, you'll find a bunch of papers by the people that uh, work on the sixth floor of this tower. Um, uh, one of them was um, a paper by uh, Shriya Pai, she was just sort of talking about how these fracton excitations can interact with each other. Um, but she just got her, she just defended her dissertation last week. So she's Dr. Shriya Pai now. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, the, the point of this slide for me is just that even though the search for a quantum hard drive has not yet uncovered a quantum hard drive, it has uncovered new physics that has been really interesting, not only to the condensed matter community, but also to um, some high energy theorists and all sorts of other people who study physics. Um, uh, yeah, so quickly, I'll just, uh, before I ask for questions, I'll just give you a little insight into what my sort of day to day research looks like. I really do spend a lot of time drawing pictures like this. Um, I, I put a lot of effort into figuring out how to translate whatever I'm trying to think about into a picture, because I think the pictures are um, a much more useful way to, to, to communicate this type of information rather than just having words and equations. Um, so I will spend my time reading papers, um, drawing. I do have to write some equations sometimes, but I try not to. Um, and then if I'm lucky, I come up with something interesting enough to write about it. Um, so. That's all, I, all of the work I do is theoretical. I don't work in a lab at all. And I also don't do any sort of computational physics. So um, I think a lot, of, a lot of theory does involve computation, uh, but if, if you're curious about what theory looks like in sort of the old fashioned pencil and paper sort of way, um, that's, that's what I do. Um, so I will close with a slide and ask for any more questions. <laughs> so um, these are pictures that I'm from, from a project that I work on right now. Uh, the way to think about these is that instead of having a two-dimensional square lattice, we have a three-dimensional cubic lattice. So these are the like the faces of the lattice squares, um, and then there's an edge of the lattice that looks right here. So this is a an operator that acts on uh, magnets that live on the faces, but then the operator is associated with an edge here. Um, same with those other two. And then that's a, a cube made out of this. So these are these are three-dimensional things. Uh, this is one where uh, we had a again a three-dimensional lattice, but then we had something different happening within this sort of slice of the cube than the rest of the cube. Uh, and then these are uh, these are pictures that describe what's happening on a two-dimensional boundary of a three-dimensional lattice. So that's the other thing that you can think about these types of lattice models is even if the lattice is two-dimensional, if it has a boundary, the boundary has to be one-dimensional. So you might have something different happening there. Yeah. So with the, with the magnets, there was the like unstable version of memory, but we were still able to use it when we have active input yeah. from a computer or something else. Yes. Are you able to do that with your quantum model? Are you able to, you know, control the yeah. strings in a way that 
it still makes it a viable method of storage. Yeah, so with something like that, it's the same idea as the one dimensional magnet where you sort of, you have to watch it and you have to catch these, these uh, excitations before they get too far apart from each other. If you catch them early enough, you can sort of move them back to each other and that's good. Um, so that, right, that's also something that people are um, actively working on um, for the 2D Torah code. Um, the thing is you just have to, you have to be able to watch it and correct errors fast enough. Um, and I cannot tell you what the status of that project is, um, but I think that that's, that's, a, that's a, viable, um, a viable avenue towards a uh, form of volatile quantum memory. I have a good question. That, that's I. If I were to make this again, I would include a slide about that. Yes. Why is it called the Toric code? Ah, yeah, right. So let me see. So let's talk about this one here. So the original idea, the original presentation of this model, was on a system where you have this two-dimensional lattice, but it's um, it's periodic in the x direction and periodic in the y direction. And that's hard to imagine on a piece of paper because if you curl your piece of paper this way, now you have the two ends and it's hard to curl them around. But if you, if you had them sort of on flexible paper, you could, you could curl them this way, so you have a tube. And now you just have to connect the two tube ends in the back, so you have a donut shape. Um, and a torus is the fancy math name for a donut shape. Um, so, uh, uh, since then, people have figured out how to use this type of model on flat pieces of paper. Um, so the name is a sort of, it's a particularly unuseful name uh, because it doesn't need to live on a torus, but name is stuck. So people still call it the torus code. And it's, it's most naturally defined on a torus. If you want to put it on a two-dimensional piece of paper, you have to talk about what you do with the boundaries. So there's just a little bit of extra information that you have to have. Yeah, yeah, we've got plenty of time. So, um, how does how is the even number rule for the vertices? How is that enforced? Is that just an innate like, property of the system, or is that like by design? Yeah, right. So, so it's 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 by design. So you you have to you have to figure out how to um, look at your quantum magnets and then set up the um, the set up the system so that they want to follow that rule. Um, it's, not, it's not an intrinsic property of the magnets. And there are all sorts of different ways to actually uh, enforce that rule. Um, at the level of theory that I do, I don't worry about the actual mechanism for that rule. I just say that that's the rule. Someone can figure out how to make it work. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, I guess in the classical case, mm -hmm. it seems like we would need to flip maybe like more than half of our magnets have to flip over before we like misread. That's exactly right. In the quantum case, if more than half of our edges flip from blue to red, like if we have so less than half, do we still read the wrong thing, or is it perfectly preserved until you sort of like go over a boundary? Yeah. Right. So let me let me go go back to this one for a minute to. Um, explain why it's half, because you're, you're right that it's half. And the reason that it's half is that if we have all of our magnets blue, and then say the, the environment flips like a quarter of them just over here, what we can do is we can look at all of the magnets and just do a majority rules type vote. Is it more blue or more red? So as long as the environment flips fewer than half the magnets, we're, we're still good. No logical error has occurred. Um, and then just with the way that the torque code is set up, the rule is that if these two excitations move halfway across the system, then a logical error has occurred. So if 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 we're if if our if the uh, distance around our donut is L, if the two excitations can get a distance L of two apart, then a logical error has occurred, and that has to do with how the the readout works. Um, is that like distance as in total number or like? I guess what is it like the Manhattan distance or whatever? Uh, or no, it's distance? it's sort of um, right. So it's it's whether if it's a vertical distance of a vertical distance of L or a horizontal distance of L. Um, 
uh, yeah, the taxi cab distance doesn't doesn't come into play. You can you can independently look at the horizontal distance and the vertical distance, and either one will cause a logical error. Any other questions? Yes. Why do you care about? Why yeah. That? Right. Right. So that's that's sort of part of this um, thing that I've I've made a point of not talking about. Sort of what is quantum information? Why do we care about it? What are quantum computers? Why would we want to store quantum information? Um, uh, I, I think that my sort of minute long answer to that is that uh, quantum information is fundamentally different than classical information. Um, and you can, you can um, perform calculations on a quantum computer in a uh, exponentially faster way than on a classical computer. And as far as the information theorists are concerned, exponentially faster means way faster. Uh, like that's all they care about. Um, so, 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 so essentially quantum computers can do things that classical computers cannot. Um, and then the reason that we care about storing the, class, the quantum information is that anytime that you want to do these computations, you have to store that information. Um, if you have some sort of viable two-dimensional Tor code, you can store it in that, but you'd need to continually watch it and supply uh, power. Whereas if we could come up with some sort of, um, some sort of, quantum hard drive, then you could just, you could sort of store your quantum information, stick it in the cabinet for a year, come back and just start your calculation right where you left off. Yes, one last question. Yes, yeah, sir. No. Uh, I'm oh. just wondering, if, in the same way that you get exponential speed up with quantum, if, if you wanted to store quantum information classically, would that take up exponentially more space to do? Yeah, yes, the, 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 the shortest answer is yes. Uh, the longest answer has to do with how closely you want to approximate the quantum information. Um, but, but in general, if you want to store some sort of uh, like normal quantum state, you'll need an exponential number of classical bits to store it. Okay, so let's thank Charlie. If uh, you have your phone and you can scan this QR code, uh, we'd love to hear your feedback on this talk. Uh, you can scan it and we'll take you to a quick Google form uh, with just a few questions. Or you can go to this link, uh, the tiny URL. And yeah, thank you for uh, coming, everyone. And if you would like to be a part of the C Prime Talk uh, team, we uh, would always like to use more help in uh, things like setting up, or if you want to give a talk yourself, or if you know someone, who might want to give a talk, or if you guys just want more free pizza, uh, feel free to talk to us. And uh, other than that, we are, uh, I hope you guys all have a great spring break. We'll be back in uh, two or three weeks. I forget which one, but be sure to check our website uh, for that. And if you have any more questions, uh, can you just stay a little bit longer just in case? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So thank you all for coming. And if anyone wants to ask me more detailed stuff, just I'll be here for another 10, 15 minutes. Great, thanks. And please eat more pizza. We have plenty left. Woo.